In our last few videos, we've been looking at Water Street, uh, uh, both the north side and the south side. And in our last video, we looked at the 500 block on the south side. And in this photograph here, which is uh, a fairly current photograph that's been supplied to us by Google Maps, we can see, uh, well, this, uh, this section here where the ledge is and the couple sitting and the hedges, that, that's a 500 block. That's where Western Union was, Stevenson's Electric was, Satellite Bar, and so forth. And then you would cross the Custom Alley, which really wasn't a street, but like it uh, says in the name, it was uh, an alley. And then, of course, you came to uh, the Federal Building, or in the old days, it was known as the Custom House. It doesn't matter how old an historical building is, there was always something there before it. And in this particular case, according to this map of 1867, you can see this block before the federal uh, building was built, and you can see some homes and businesses there. But before we had the federal building, before we had those homes and businesses, and before we had satellite imaging like we're seeing here, we had the maps that looked like this. Maps that didn't show the expressways and highways of Michigan, but rather the territories and which Indians were in those territories. And Port Huron was no exception. Before the city of Port Huron, there was Indian reservations. This area was originally inhabited by the Chippewa Indians. Later on, they were uh, given by their enemies up into the northern part of Michigan. And then this area was inhabited by their enemies, the Iroquois, and also the Huron and the Wyandots. I'm going to give you a quick overview, and then I'd like to read something for you. Chippewa Indians got tired of the harsh winters and the weather up in the upper part of Michigan and they decided they wanted to come back uh, to where they originally were, uh, the Detroit area, the Port Huron area, and, uh, certainly the southern area of Michigan. And so a war party of uh, 400 canoes or so came down Lake Huron, part of them going uh, up to Saginaw Bay and coming and attacking the Wyandots in Detroit and the others coming down uh, the shore of uh, Lake Huron, uh, the St. Clair River to Black River, and attacking the Iroquois here in Port Huron. This story is recorded in the book, The Pioneer Society of the State of Michigan, and uh, this was back in 1884. If you want to read the complete story, you can find this online, but I'd like to read an excerpt uh, from this uh, book for you now. Iroquois, or more especially the Hurons and the Wyandots, their ancient enemies, held the warmer and pleasanter lands at the east and to the south of Lake Huron. Chippewas claimed that they had once held and been unjustly driven from these favorite hunting grounds, and the Iroquois being involved in the wars between the French and English, they resolved, under the lead of Caicons, to make a determined and well-concerted effort to drive them from their possessions. Caicons gathered his warriors and launched in 400 canoes to traverse the waters of Lake Huron. A park came up to Saginaw Bay and landing on that river pursued their course by land as to strike the Wyandots near Detroit, while the larger part followed the coast of the St. Clair River, landing near the mouth of a smaller stream, since known as Black River, and passing a large camp of Iroquois at the foot of the lake near what is now known as Fort Gratiot. Nibicants, then a young man, came with his father and described the canoes as holding eight warriors each and enough to extend the whole length of the big river. Scarce had a landing been effected when the battle commenced, a battle as described by him unequal in any strife where Indians alone were the combatants. From side to side of the stream since known as Black River, the contest surged till after days of terrible carnage, the Iroquois yielding were driven across the great river and far into Canada. The detachment sent against the Wyandots had been equally successful and the two conquering forces joining stopped not in the pursuit until they had driven their ancient foes across the Niagara. So why did I want to go into detail on all this? Well, because of the next paragraph. Numbers of great burial mounds filled with skeletons, Indian weapons, and ornaments until a recent day attested the terrible slaughter one large one on the ground, now covered by the United States Custom House, was devoted to the distinguished Chippewa Braves. 
there were too many to be placed in bark tombs above the ground, after the usual manner of Indian burials, and they were buried in a mound of earth. This next paragraph uh, occurred years later. It says this, when the Indian Reserve, known as O'Reilly Reserve, covering the western portion of Port Huron and the ground on which the Custom House stands, was released and put in market, the friends of the Indian chieftains caused their bones to be removed to a burial ground in the south part of the city that has since been vacated, and in the removal all traces of their remains have been lost. On the spot where they first joined their fathers in the happy hunting grounds of the Indian dead, the government that has been so unmindful of Indian rights and Indian memories has unconsciously erected a monument, it is true, not to their honor, but a memory that will for ages mark the place of burial of the Indian hero dead, a fitting memento of the fast disappearing red men and of the fact that all that they were and all their rights have gone, glimmering down the dreams of things that were. We know that the Indian burial ground was larger than the block where the custom building would be built. It appears to have gone uh, north of Water Street as well, almost probably to the river, at least as far as the firehouse that was on Water Street at that time. And you can see the firehouse on the right side of this photograph. Because in an article in the Portia and Sunday Herald dated October 24, 1886, a gentleman writes, uh, referring to the burial grounds, this, I see the Sunday Herald this week spoke of the Indian burial ground where the custom house is. Dr. Nash got the citizens together and had the bodies moved. I helped remove the bodies from there. I remember one Indian who was buried where the engine house is. He was evidently some big chief. His body was enclosed in birch and bark, and a snow white blanket was wound round the body. Twelve scalps were buried with him. Perhaps some of you are like me. You knew there were Indians in Port Huron before the settlers came. Some of you even knew that where the custom house is, it was once an Indian burial ground. But did you know the full story behind the burial ground? I didn't, but now I do, and so do you. All right, let's look at the reason why this building was built in the first place. This photo here that's being expanded is Port Huron in 1865. I thought you might uh, like to see what it looked like at that particular uh, point in time because this is when the custom building was first being considered by the citizens of Port Huron. In the history of St. Clair, Michigan, uh, Jinx writes this. During the year of 1865, the customs business of this region attained such proportions as to convince the government authorities that the interests of the Revenue Service would be advanced by the organization of a new district separate from that of Detroit, of which it was then a part. In the winter of 1865-66, definite movement was made by our citizens to secure creation of the new district, and a delegation of our leading businessmen among them James Sanborn, Henry Fish, and John Sanborn, Henry Howard, and F.L. Wells proceeded to Washington to labor for the result which was attained in the April following by the passage of the bill creating the Custom District of Huron, embracing the 22 counties and all the frontier from Lake St. Clair to the Straits of Mackinac, a line of coast of fully 550 miles counting the bays and inlets of Lake Huron. Omar Conger was elected to Congress in 1868. Among the first bills introduced in the House by him was one providing for the erection of a government building at this point. After the usual delays with such measures meet within Congress, the bill was finally passed June 10, 1872, and approved by the President the same day. It authorized the Director of the Secretary of the Treasury to purchase at private sale or by condemnation pursuance of the statute of the State of Michigan, a suitable lot of ground in the city of Port Huron, State of Michigan, and a cause to be erected thereon a building suitable for the accommodation of the Custom House, Bonded Warehouse, and other government offices in that city. As you can see from the copy of this bill, the uh, building was not to exceed $200,000.
decision was made, the next thing was to find a piece of land to put it on. There is some rivalry between the north and south sides of Black River and the effort to secure the location of the building, and various spots were placed in competition, most of which, however, were excluded by the exactions of the government, which were that the site should be bounded on at least three sides by streets or alleys. The site that this building sits on today was finally selected. The price of the lot was $10,000. 5000 of which sum was paid by subscriptions of citizens so that the cost of the government was less than had been anticipated. You can see from this drawing here that that particular piece of land qualified because you had Water Street on one side, you had 6th Street on the other, and what would become known as the Custom Alley on the other side. Plans were at once prepared under the supervision of A.B. Mullet, then the supervising architect of the Treasury Department. I can't pass this gentleman by without taking a little side trip. Mr. Mullet was a very controversial character, so bear with me. Mullet trained in the Cincinnati office of architect Isaiah Rogers and became a partner until he left on less than friendly terms in 1860 to establish his own practice. After serving with the Union Army, Mullet in 1863 relocated to Washington to again work Hunter Rogers, who was then the supervising architect at the Treasury Department. But he undermined his superior's position until an exasperated Rogers resigned in 1865. Although widely dismissed as an obscure draftsman from Cincinnati, he used political skill to get appointed supervising architect in 1866, and so designed fireproof federal buildings across the nation, particularly custom houses, post offices, and courthouses. He was responsible for contracting local architects and construction companies to deal with subcontractors, source materials, and other matters. He gained a reputation as a micromanaging authoritarian with an explosive temper. I think this building here is most similar to the custom building that we have. When he was making these buildings, he didn't get into much trouble. It's when he started changing designs that he ran into a lot of controversy. Over his career, he produced some 40 government buildings. The ones that got him in the most trouble were the Second Empire-type buildings. These were modeled after some of the extravagant uh, architectural designs of Europe. He produced six of these in major cities uh, around the United States. This is a custom house and post office in St. Louis, Missouri. But these were stone and cast iron structures with mansard roofs and multiple tiers of columns. They were very expensive, and he was dogged by accusations of extravagance and subjected to five separate investigations into his ties to the corrupt granite ring. The granite ring was a group of dishonest quarry owners had sufficient power to arrange that simple brick walls in a basement, for example, Philadelphia's post office, would be replaced by finely dressed granite. This happened at many of Mullet's building with the speculation that Mullet was getting a kickback. An accident during the building's construction on May 1, 1877 killed three workers when a concrete slab collapsed, prompting an investigation by the city and a public rebuttal of accusations of misconduct from Mullet. This building originally was the State War and Navy building because it housed the departments of State War and Navy. And this building, probably more than any of the other ones, uh, gave Alfred Mollett uh, the most criticism. For example, Mark Twain says this, It's the ugliest building in America. President Harry Truman called it the greatest monstrosity in America. And historian Henry Adams called it Mollett's Architectural Infant Asylum. Others called it the mysterious gray building that resembles a battleship in the rain and a wedding cake in the sun. It took 17 years to build at a cost of $10 million in 1888. Can you imagine what that would be today? It was also a popular political target. The New York Sun called him the most arrogant, pretentious, and preposterous little humbug in the United States. In 1890, in financial trouble and ill health, Mullet killed himself in Washington. 
I don't know about you, but I like some of his buildings. I think they have a certain charm. And this building is still around today. I think his buildings had a certain uh, longevity to it. I mean, look at our building in Port Huron. This building would go on to become the old executive office building in D.C. and later on would be called the uh, Eisenhower Executive Office Building. He received much criticism over the years, but today he is recognized for his contribution to monumental Victorian architecture. Well, guess what? We ran out of time, and I haven't got to the building yet. But... I think maybe today you might have learned something more about uh, the ground that this building sat on, the Indian burial ground, and who was buried there. And the architect uh, that designed this building, perhaps you know a little bit more about him today too. But in our next video, we'll get on with the building of the Custom House, so join me then.